we are doing another panel discussion. We have uh, we brought out the heavy hitters for uh, for a heavy album here. Uh, we're doing a Dark Horse uh, Dio Strange Highways. So we've got once again an esteemed panel. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give uh, everyone here uh, a chance to go around and, and introduce themselves uh, when they give their review. We're going to change the format just a little bit. Uh, just some housekeeping stuff to go over. Uh, we've got about an hour here, so approximately 10 minutes per person. Try and keep it uh, fairly concise, and let's all uh, keep our energy up. Uh, for you folks at home, you know, we're, we're thinking about you guys. Uh, <clears throat> there is a Patreon. If you want to join these conversations, if you want to be part of the contrarians panels uh, any tier of the patreon will get you access to these conversations uh so you know please feel free to uh to join uh and of course if you don't want to uh, support us in that way please like and subscribe if you're liking the content it goes a long way uh please share contrarians around if there's someone you think be interested in it we, we want to hear their voice we want to get them in here uh there's also the merch stuff there's uh, i think it's uh, t public i believe uh yes. where you can get some contrarian shirts um they're pretty cool. Uh, I, I wish I could afford one. Uh, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, there's also a Kofi uh, if you want to get Martin a, a coffee. I think maybe it's pronounced. I'm not sure. It's it's there in the description if you uh, if you want to support uh, us that way. So uh, we're gonna go around and we're gonna give each person their say on Do Strange uh, Highways. This is a dark horse panel, so we'll be uh, getting a little rating and we'll we'll see what people think. Uh, just for everyone here, uh, we're in the interest of saving time. We're just going to ask that you do sort of your plugs and your introduction right at the start uh, of your uh, session, just to, to keep things moving along smoothly. <clears throat> we got a great panel here. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining and I want to thank everyone at home for watching. So with all that being said, I'm going to dive into a little bit of the research that uh, Marco has so graciously provided for me. So according to Wikipedia, Strange Highways, released in 1993, charted at 142 in the U.S. and sold about 75,000 copies compared to Holy Diver and Last in Line, which both went platinum, and Sacred Heart, which went gold. Strange Highways did not have an official single released, according to the always truthful, truthful Wikipedia. Uh, best ever albums had Strange Highways at number 13 and Holy Diver at number one. Not a big surprise. Uh, Chaos Spin ranked the 10 best Dio albums and had Strange Highways at number eight and said, many fans consider Strange Highways Dio's darkest and heaviest album. Highlights from the album include the title track, Give Her the Gun. Uh, sorry, include the title track, Give Her the Gun and Bring Down the Rain. Uh, Ultimate Classic Rock rated the Dio albums and put Strange Highways at number eight. And they said, <clears throat> it was deja vu all over again for Ronnie James Dio drummer Vinny Apice uh, as they again faced life after Black Sabbath following the controversial end of the Dehumanizer reunion and resurrected Dio for the 1993's Strange Highways. This time guitarist Tracy G and Dawkins bassist Jeff Pilsen completed the band's lineup but their efforts couldn't overcome all the drama of the previous year to say nothing of the era's low tolerance for metal. So highlights were confined to the defiant title track and the amazingly heavy Bring Down the Rain and a raging uh, indictment of child abuse, give her the gun. Their number one Dio album was Holy Diver. All Music gave the album three stars and said Dio is in fine voice as usual, especially on Hollywood Black, and the emotive opener Jesus, Mary, and the Holy Ghost provides a nice, generally staccato guitar flow that harkens back to the glory days when Vivian Campbell filled the six-string slot in the group's finest lineup. Original drummer apiece, Hopefully I'm saying that right. Seems to have lost some energy, tone, and sharpness by the time of this release, which is too bad considering that he had formerly personified all those qualities. As a unit, however, Dio provided that they can lay down some deadly riffs as songs like Pain and Firehead keep a nice momentum going throughout this return to solo work for Ronnie James Dio after a brief second tour of duty with Black Sabbath. Strange Highways was a salt. Strange Highways is a solid effort with some of Dio's better late career material, powerful singing and strong performances all around. So we're gonna go around and uh, in no particular, oh, actually no, Martin, would you like to go first or last? I'm giving you the uh, decision here. Uh, let me go first, I suppose. Sure. All right. Um, okay, so uh, so yeah, this this came out uh, October 15th, 93, I guess. I guess apparently it's uh, it's on reprise in 94 in America and Vertigo in 93 in Europe. Um, 
produced by Mike Fraser, which is interesting. Working at Rumble Recorders in LA, 52 minutes long. So it's a, it's a, you know, a, a fairly average album, like longer than the LP days, not super long for a CD. Um, so I went on, I went on Guitar Hack. I think Pete Pardo was with us. Um, and we ranked the Dio catalog and I put it in seventh out of uh, 10. 10 records. So I had it kind of middle of the pack. Uh, my general feeling on it, first of all, is that um, it's part of a trilogy with Lock Up the Wolves and and um, Angry Machines. But it but it's the one where so Lock Up the Wolves is obviously the, the previous guitarist, the young 18 year old Rowan Robertson. Right. Um, but it is it is the first of the of the really slow Dio albums, I think. Um, but I also feel like the wheels were falling off. Um, it, it was a, it was a big drop from dream evil, which I love. So I, I just had two weeks ago, I had this come out dream evil deal in the eighties. Um, I love dream evil so much. I named the book after it. It, it literally is my favorite deal album. Um, and of course I love last in line and, and, uh, Holy diver as well. But the thing about this one is it still looks in terms of the album cover art front and back like a major label release um and angry machines it's definitely not on a major la label at that point and the the back cover is kind of like you know sketchy layout and i think there's just the three guys pictured on it and stuff um uh, you know the front cover is pretty cool but it, it just it just feels like to me angry machines uh reflects that step down although i might even like it a tiny bit more but there's something about this record that still feels very much like a, a proper major label release. Um, it definitely is a sister album to uh, Dehumanizer, the, the Black Sabbath record uh, that when that thing all crashed in flames and, and Ronnie and Vinny, you know, uh, came out and went back to this. Um, uh, but I think the production is a little bit better than Dehumanizer and maybe the songs are about roughly on par. Generally speaking, I, I definitely admire this album but i don't like it a lot my my heart isn't into it in a big way when i play it i go on paper it's pretty good but uh, on paper what what's always bothered me about this album is i don't like the front end as much as the back end although i do love opener jesus mary and the holy ghost that that reminds me with that ding, ding, you know it, it has that uh, king crimson 20 20th century 21st century wow, what century is that song 21st century. 21st century, schizoid man, yes. Um, so it's got that thing going for it. And um uh and it's it's very proggy and heavy, and it's it's uh it's got a little tempo to it, but then things slow down for firehead and slow down even slower for strange highways, and and there's just this sort of evolution's got this kind of chromatic atmospheric abstract sort of feel to it. Hollywood black mm -hmm. is slow as well. Um Pain is slow on here as well. That, that's one with kind of open spaces, which is kind of cool. I, I do like that. But by this point, I feel like I'm in Egypt and the chains are on kind of thing. Uh, but things kind of pick up. Um, and that's what I like. I really like One Foot in the Grave. That's kind of the slightly, uh, it's still slow, but it's got that funky, groovy little bluesiness to it. It's a little different. Very angry album. I mean, Dio's vocals are angry. I think Vinny sounds great on it. And he's, and he's playing, and this is, this is the one thing, this is probably the main album out of Vinny's catalog. When you, when you analyze what Vin, Vinny does well and one thing that you say Vinny does well is he plays slow well. This is, this is the clinic uh, album for him in that respect because he's not on all the other slow Dio albums, right? Um, uh, Give Her the Gun, not, not crazy about that one. That's got the, the, uh, the acoustic feel to it. And then I think that's, that occurs three times in it, but it has a bunch of cool, weird parts in it, which is kind of cool. Blood from a Stone, I really like. Squarely mid-tempo, that one. And Here's to You, the only fast one on it I like. I think they do a good job with that. And, and on that one, you get to see the great chemistry of this band. Jeff Pilson fits in anywhere and he'll give great chemistry to anything. But I think Tracy G hugely underrated. And you have to say that because he's kind of hated. Um, there's, there's a lot of um, animosity towards what he does, but when he pulls off a guitar solo, I, I think you hear a little bit of a uh, Viv, you hear a little bit of Tony Iommi um, and, and you hear some kind of loopy, interesting, super creative things out of him. So he's, I think he's a very entertaining guitar soloist. Um, 
And then you get to the end, bring down the rain. Uh, that's also a favorite on here, kind of a mid-tempo juggernauty kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is the record of all the slow ones. And in that I'd include Magicka and Master of the Moon. And then these three, so there's five, I would say, that are, are kind of too slow for me. Uh, I think this is, I think Angry Machine is the least slow of the five slow. And I kind of, my heart likes that one better, but I think my head tells me intellectually, I think this is the best of the slow period deal records. Um, so I'm going to go, boy, I'm stuck between a 7.5 and an eight. Um, I think I'm going to stick with a 7.5. I, I think it's, I think that's a good sober grade for this record. 7.5. Awesome. 7.5. Do you want to do your, uh, you started your plugs right well, now? Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, martinpopoff.com, of course, for all the books. I mean, that the deal thing is out. And uh, of course, I got the audio podcast as well, History and Five Songs. That comes out every Tuesday. And tomorrow's is, uh, what the heck is tomorrow's on? I can't even remember what it's on. Um, but I've done a mod one recently. I've done a pub rock one recently. Is there a new wave of British heavy metal sound is recent. Bands with angry fans is recent. And, uh, yeah, I'm drawing a complete blank. What the heck did I do this last episode on? Anyways, we'll all we'll all be surprised and find out tomorrow. How's that? All right. Not all the first right. sounding great albums, is it? The yes, it is. That's album? it. Yes, that's right. Because I because I uh, asked asked a few of you guys. Yeah, that's right. So it's uh, it's the it's the first albums that are objectively really 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 good sounding, and with the qualification being. They have to be in a in a challenging genre, so not too mellow, not jazz. So that, so what I've picked is kind of a mix of prog and he, and hard rock. Oh, sounds interesting. All right, so uh, seven point five is our first rating. Uh, Peter, why don't we go with uh, you next? Why don't you tell us uh, what your opinion is? Oh, great. Good to see everybody. Thank you for having me again. It's great to be here. A lot of things that Martin said, I agree with completely, and I'll probably go a little further than he will uh, in my like for it. And I really think of it this way, and timing is everything and it's nothing. I mean it this way is that if this album had come out at a different time, what would it have felt like or how would it have been received? But the problem with that is that he had to go through the things he did to get to this album. So, you know, you think of it that way say, and you say, well, it's the perfect album after what happened with Dehumanizer and where he came out. And even Dehumanizer itself really kind of didn't fit in with what was going on at the time. And this just kind of reinforces that because this kind of takes, like Martin said, Dehumanizer to, to the second level. Um, I look at this record and it's the heaviest, the darkest, it's the most brooding. I call it the most mature of Ronnie though. Uh, there's no dragons, there's no rainbows, and there's no wizards here. This is not part of any of that ilk. This is adult themes. This is a lot of life's contradictions, religion, violence. Uh, again, the real life issue about abuse. Um, this is Ronnie taking on all these topics that he sometimes would get criticized for when he was writing in that mythical, mystical kind of way. Um, it, to echo what Martin said, this record does not happen if Vinnie Apice is not on drums. It just doesn't happen. He is just perfect on these slow and heavy songs. As Martin said, I could not agree with that more. And his playing is so strong and so powerful and he's so great at leaving space, but yet being interesting enough that in versus the way Simon approaches things, Simon just doesn't have the facility to kind of fill in those areas with the, with the, with a better groove or a better feel that, than Vinny has. Uh, Mike Frazier's production is a huge upgrade. This is a tremendous sounding record. And when you listen to this and then play back Holy Diver or even Last in Line, they really sound kind of small and thin. That's not a referendum on the songs. I love the records, but sonically they do sound kind of small. And this is what I really love about this one. It's got what I've referenced called the max mix that you can give it as much volume as you want in your system. And it just stays intact and it just sounds amazing. I love Tracy G's guitar tone. 
It's a cross, and Martin's right again. You're going to get a lot of that, Martin. Here's I go. It's a, it's a lot between Tony and Viv. It's kind of in the middle. Um, if you were to think of one as a tenor and one and alto, and one's a bass, he's like a tenor. He sits in the middle. He's able to chunk and be heavy on the low end, but he can be fluid up and the higher neck of the strings. Um, and I think it really, really works. It's a very unconventional type of playing for the guitarists that he's had with Vivian and Iomi and Blackmore, of course. Um, he riffs differently. He phrases differently. He does a lot of things that normally I might not care for, the pick squeals and the harmonic growls and those types of things, but they work for me here. And I don't know if it's just the combination of everything, but they just work. Um, Dio sings better than ever. His voice is so strong and he's got so much clarity, but he's got so much aggression and he's biting off all of his words and everything is so poignant in his phrasing. And it's it making a point with that more adult theme, they could come out with a little more authenticity, uh, a little more uh, respect in that sense. Um, again, I put no, no, it's all more adult lyrics here. And so when I'm looking at the tracks, you know, I love the opener. Um, I was lucky to see them in 97 in April at Jackhammers in Schomburg, which is one of the out places that live Inferno was recorded. Um, so seeing some of these live even puts them into a different perspective because they were absolutely exceptional in Tracy, especially. Um, but I love the power in Jesus, Mary and the Holy ghost. Um, it's his lyrics are so great right off the shot prime time nursery rhyme did you see the teacher sister black and white what's she gonna do anybody who's followed him where he talks about his catholic upbringing he talks about the nuns and and how he wasn't sure and was always confused what do they mean what are they telling me they say eye for eye tooth for tooth but don't hurt your brother and he's like wait a second it's this contradiction and contradictions start and carry through the whole theme of, of the album, almost in a sense, like heaven and hell is, is it this, am I the good guy? Am I the bad guy? Is this good for you? Is it not good for you? Make your choices. Be careful which one you pick. Um, I love going into firehead. It's just a deep, deep pocket. Um, and Jeff Pilson adds kind of that low bass that I love that works with this kind of band. I love Jimmy Bain, but I never felt that he foundationally held the kind of bottom that Jeff brought to these recordings. Um, so it really works. Plus adding his backing vocals occasionally when they need him is a real help. And plus he's fun on stage. He's fun to watch. Um, so I'm not really sure what firehead means. But that's okay. But I just love how it sounds. Uh, we get to Strange Highways. To me, and Martin brought up Egypt. I think of all the times that he pulled out the slower songs that sometimes work, Shame on the Night, or any of these other songs. This is where he perfected it. To me, this is the ultimate of those slower songs. It's so, so intensely slow and powerful and really hard to play on drums. <laughs> There's so much space. It's hard to do it authentically. Um, again, some really great lyrics about guilt and shame. And, you know, um, you know, here's my confession. It's the, it's the only broken rule. Sometimes I crawl inside of myself where I can be the fool. It's just, it's just, you're wondering, it makes you think, Oh, wait a second. It's things to think about. And I, I like that. It's a great solo. I like the way, uh, what I really love is in the first verse, Tracy doesn't play at all. It's just Jeff and Vinny slamming underneath while Ronnie sings the first verse. And then once he comes in, starts giving that great chunk underneath it and just takes it to a whole new level. And they just keep progressing through the rest of the song. Hollywood Black is a great song. Um, I love this lyric. Most dreams are made of glass. You throw just one stone and there goes the last window. Um, there's a lot there to think about. And can't you tell that every wish that you've made filled up the well? You know, 
And all of these are like very introvertive thinking types of things versus, you know, again, a wizard and those aren't bad, but it's just very different. Um, evolution. Um, I think lyrically, this is his version of war pigs where it's just all about society being all screwed up and it's all the things that we think about and that hope and fears and you know we what is really flourishing has society gotten better computer gods was part of that are we evolving in the right direction he's suggesting perhaps the only thing that's really evolving here is evil and are we aware of that? And are we doing what we can to make sure that doesn't happen? Uh, pain's just heavy. It's just really, really dark. And it's some of the most aggressive vocals Ronnie's ever done. Um, and again, a lot of space for the drums and everything to breathe. Uh, one foot in the grave, again, more religion. Um, it's a straightforward rocker, which at this stage of the album, I really appreciate. Um, Because it goes through the phases, the end of it builds on a nice up note. Um, So I like that one. Give her the gun the same way. And blood from a stone. And here's to you. All of those together, um, and I'll spare the details of every individual track for time here, but they all work. And they all have a great feel. And especially here's to you. Vinny's just killing it. And he's just thundering away. And I love the breakdown. Um, And to me, that one has a riff that's very similar to uh, things that were on Dream Evil. Um, And that one seems to work for me in that context. I think part of the problem that some fans had with Tracy is that his own material, he did really, really well. And as far as the riffs, he did really great. But I think when he went to the Viv era, he wouldn't play Vivian's solos. He would do his own solos. And I think for from an auth- authenticity standpoint, that turns some fans off because Vinny's Vivian's solos are well respected. Um, so I think live that may have turned many off to it. Um, that's a conjecture. I don't know that for sure. Um, but I think it's a tremendous record. And uh, I've heard this probably the third most of everything in his catalog. And I've got everything in real time. Um, for me, I've got it socked in the second spot behind last in line um, with Holy Diver trailing right behind it. But I've got this in a, as a nine and a half. I, I think last in line is a perfect record. So I've, I've got last in line at a 10, but to me, I could listen to this from top to bottom. Anytime it's, just the right flavor for what I like. And it just works for me on, on every level. So I think it's a tremendous record. Nice. Hey, uh, awesome. Nick, I, I wanted to mention before I forget, uh, this was Nick's suggestion, a very good suggestion. Um, I was talking to the guys before, if I'm to do a follow-up to this book, I was going to call it killing the dragon deal in the nineties and two thousands. But I find, um, I don't have any pictures and I don't know anybody with any pictures. So if anybody shot the band, um, starting on the lock up the wolves tour all the way up to the end, uh, master of the moon, uh, dates, uh, that whole nineties, two thousands period. Let me know in Facebook or on, on our, on our contrarians Facebook page, or just if, if you're part of my regular friend thing or the history of five songs or put a comment in the thing. But, uh, yeah, if you or any of your buddies have ever shot the band live, um, I would like to talk to you. And uh, one last thing I want to say, Peter, I think that's the first time referendum has ever been used on a con- contrarians episode. So that's very cool. Thanks for using the word referendum. Yes, sir. <laughs> but Everyone was cross awesome. off their bingo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was really cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Peter, why don't, you, why don't you tell the folks at home a little bit about yourself? Uh, you, can, you can do a plug if you got one. And uh, well, yeah. I don't have anything to plug. Uh, I am uh, a father of four. Um, I've been drumming uh, since I was nine so i'm approaching just a little 50 years now i'm a degree musician in jazz and classical music um and i've been listening to rock since i could ar- argue with my parents to allow them to let me stay up to watch this is tom jones back in 1968 yeah. so nice. uh, i'm a huge music fan uh, all across the board i have two older sisters six three and six years older who also love music so i was exposed to a decade before 
I really should have been, which was a great blessing. And I thank them for that a lot, but I'm um, great to be here. I love being invited and sharing things that we love with everybody. So thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we got a 7.5. We got a 9.5. Oh, uh, one thing for the folks at home. Uh, when we said uh, that there was my idea, not, not the, not the topic, <laughs> the uh, crowdsourcing of, uh, of images there. Just want to make sure I'm not stealing him. It's under. All right. Uh, Reed, let's uh, keep it going right along with your thoughts. Okay. Um, I'm going to try not to go over too much old territory. So uh, I have some different thoughts to add, but first, uh, Peter Firehead, Dio said in many interviews, simply referred to the angry young man. The man who is so angry he was about to explode is Firehead. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Um, so uh, uh, Dio is literally the artist I grew up with, right? Um, Holy Diver came out when I was 15. I followed his career my entire music listening life, more or less. Uh, cause starting with Black Sabbath um, and then going back into the Rainbow Years. So I'm a, a very, very big Dio fan. Uh, and that also means that I went through the ups and downs with heavy metal in the 80s and 90s. And I think I want to put this album a little bit in context. So uh, when Nick gave us the sales numbers at the beginning, I want people to understand that is what is referred to as a sound, sa sound scan sales number the old sales were based on how many units a record company shipped to the retailers so if you sold a million records you didn't actually sell a million records to people you sold a million to stores and then stores would pass them on to people or not the sound scan era was when they had barcodes and they would scan them at sales and you knew literally how many units were being sold and all of a sudden artists all across the uh all across the field took massive nosedives in sales because you could see how much they were actually selling. So um, a, a source I was looking at from 2009 said that as of 2009, the 1990 album Lock Up the Wolves had sold 49,000 copies on SoundScan. Strange Highways sold 75,000 copies and it didn't actually chart as high. Uh, Lock Up the Wolves charted at number 61 out of 200 and then tanked uh strange highways had some legs and then angry machines was like 40,000. it was just a huge drop off so i think if you're going to talk about this album you can't have a serious discussion without talking about the 1990 album lock up the wolves trying to avoid the glare there and black sabbath's dehumanizer so i've said many times Ronnie was clearly happiest when he was in Black Sabbath. He kept going back to that band, no matter how bad relations were with them at various points, he kept going back to Black Sabbath. That was clearly what he wanted to do. Every album he did was based on the format of the album Heaven and Hell, not the Rainbow albums, because Rainbow was clearly Richie's thing. But once he started putting out Holy Diver is, for all intents and purposes, Mob Rules Part 2. It starts with a fast song. It goes to the epic song. Um, and that he followed that pattern his entire career. He loved being part of Black Sabbath. So in 1990, he puts out Lock Up the Wolves. This was the last traditional Dio album. Now, I'm hoping we'll do a Dark Horse panel on this, and I have a lot to say about it. But the fact is, it tanked. Um, if you can see the cutout slot there, I bought this the year it was released. It was in the delete bin the year of release. It did nothing. I understand it was better accepted in Europe, perhaps. Uh, and I don't know how it did in the rest of the world. I lived in Oklahoma City at the time, and I can tell you it didn't sell copies in Oklahoma City at all. Plus, it's not a very good album. Um, for a number of reasons. I said, hopefully we'll save that for another show. It tanks, Dio leaves and goes to Black Sabbath. I'm sure he would have been happy to stay in Black Sabbath for the rest of his career, but Dio is smart. He sees the writing on the wall when Ozzy starts making overtures about rejoining Black Sabbath. And uh, there was no way he could, you know, I mean, Ozzy was going to steamroll over him and take his band. So he left in a huff and he releases Strange Highways. And Strange Highways is, for all intents and purposes, Dehumanizer Part 2. 
uh, at least on Ronnie's part, it is the same type of songwriting. But of course, he has a completely new team. He brings Vinny with him from Black Sabbath. And then he adds Tracy G. Tracy G had been in a band with Vinny in Los Angeles, World War Three, um, which is how they got it introduced. And Jeff Pilsen. And I thought that was a weird mix at the time because I liked Dawkins. But I had a real I, I was like, how is this going to work? <laughs> well, it works great. Jeff is a phenomenal bassist and he works in a lot of situations. Um, but he had a choice at this point, right? It's now 1993 and grunge has hit. Now, people get weird about the, um, the narrative of heavy metal. Heavy metal did fantastically in the 1990s. What tanked in the 1990s was hair metal, which we didn't call hair metal at the time. But hair metal had already killed off traditional heavy metal. So stuff like Lock Up the Wolves, that was very much in the, the market fringe, right? What was marketable was thrash, and then hair metal, and then grunge killed off hair metal, and thrash went more mainstream. So your Megadeths and your Metallicas and even Testament and some of the harder thrash bands are all putting out more mainstream albums in the 90s. Now, Dio has put out, Dio, by 1990, this is a legacy superstar. He could have uh, rested on his laurels and done what many, many metal bands done, done, sheesh, my English, did and gone to the Eastern Bloc countries because the Iron Curtain has fallen, right? It's the fall of the Soviet Union and that new market has opened up and a lot of bands like Deep Purple and Uriah Heep, they were going East because there were fans hungry for that old 1970s, 1980s heavy metal and South America. Like Iron Maiden spent the entirety of the 90s basically touring Eastern Europe and South America, right? And they did that until... The wheel turned and they were suddenly hot again in 2000. And Dio could have done that. He could have toured exclusively playing Rainbow, Black Sabbath, and songs off of his first two albums and just had a career doing that. But he didn't. He decided to do something new. And in interviews at the time, he said he had been listening to Tool and Napalm Death and Man, there is no tool or napalm death in Strange Highways, so I don't get that at all, other than the fact that he was listening to current music and saying, okay, the traditional music I was doing is dead. No one's buying it, but rather than be a legacy artist, I'm going to put out the heaviest album I've ever done. And he got Tracy G. And by the way, I just watched an interview with Tracy G. I mean, like a very recent interview with Tracy G. That seems like the nicest guy on the planet. Um, so props to him, man. But um, they do this album. And after having listened to Lock Up the Wolves, which I thought was disappointing on multiple levels, I had no expectations for this album. It's not like you could hear it on the radio before you picked it up. I was a Dio fan. I was going to buy it. I took it home. And the first thing you hear is squealing feedback and that dive bomb and the chunking riff and then when Ronnie comes in, he's using a vocal style, a distorted vocal style that he didn't use on any other recordings except some of Dehumanizer. So, I mean, it's an, one, it's an attention getter. That, I mean, it gets your attention. And two, it was very different. And I went, oh, okay, he's trying something different. And you know what? I was on board from Listen One. Um, I think the album is phenomenal. Now, one thing I will point out, I don't, I love uh, Vinny Apice as a drummer. After discussing this album with Peter offline, I went back and looked at my high tier, low tier Dio albums and realized all of my high tier Dio albums have Vinny on drums, which I would never have noticed because I'm not a drummer. I'm an, I'm a bedroom guitarist and amateur luthier. You can see that flying V over my shoulder. I made that. In, uh, made and painted that. It's my tribute to K.K. Downing back there. Nice. Um, so I'm into guitar players. And uh, Tracy G, as much as I love his style, it's weird and noisy. No one else was doing anything like him. And with the exception of one song, Tracy doesn't stop playing. Well, two songs, sorry. Because he doesn't play during the first verse of Strange Highways. And then Pain has space. 
every other song, he is playing notes continually from start to finish. It is the most guitar dense album Dio ever did, which I thought was a weird choice because he was always more about leave me space to sing, right? That space does not exist on this album. It is all Tracy all the time. He does all that weird squealing harmonics before he does the solos. Uh, but like you say, the flip side is he was a terrible mimic for Vin, um, for Vivian. So, and, and I'm wearing the shirt. This was the first concert in 1994. I took my then girlfriend, now wife, to see this show. She was like, so what kind of music are you into? And I was like, Dio's in town. We're going to Dio. And we're still together. So she didn't, uh, didn't hold it against me. Um, very noisy, very heavy. Plays with his gain all the way up on his amplifiers. I think he's got delay and effects. But um, never stops playing. And, and I don't think any other Dio album ever had that level of overplaying on it. And then you get to pain and suddenly there's these giant spaces and it really sticks out. And maybe that's one of the reasons that it, it stands out on that album. Um, the other thing is I'm going to take a slightly different view of Dio's slower catalog than Martin is because I like to distinguish a difference between tempo and intensity, right? So you've got a lower number of beats, but the songs are just as or more intense. A lot of that is clearly now that I've thought about it, chatted with Peter, it has to do with Vinny, but it has to do with Vinny and Tracy. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, Jeff Pilson, if you listen to Jesus, Mary and the Holy Ghost, he's, he's doing this weird vibrato, you know, barrel, barrel, barrel. Nobody does that on bass. It was a fantastic uh, performance choice. Um, but the songs are very intense. And I contrast that with anything Ozzy put out post um, No More Tears, where his songs are plodding and just no energy, except Scream, actually. I think the album he did with Gus G, Scream, has some pretty good energy on it. But like 13, 13 is a plodding piece of crap from start to finish. I hate that album. If you compare it to Heaven and Hell, The Devil You Know, the tempos aren't any higher, but the songs have a lot more energy at the exact same tempo. And for me, Strange Highways has all of that energy to keep me interested. Uh, and some of that probably has to do with, you know, like I say, Tracy G just squirting notes all over the album. Um, but I love it. I love every single performance. But I am taking off half a point because in the early 90s, Every heavy metal band that wanted some sort of social relevance did songs about child abuse. And you know what? I don't care how good a song it is. I don't want to hear it. It's depressing. Uh, I would rather, it's not something that I enjoy listening to people sing about uh, child abuse. Uh, Motorhead did it. Aerosmith did it. Uh, just everybody was, I remember a rock critic was like, geez, another song about child abuse. Are you kidding me? Um, and I got so tired of that in the 90s, and I'm not any more up on it now. But other than that, I love everything about this album. I'm giving it nine and a half. Nice. Awesome. Two nine and a half. Yeah. Very wow. cool, Reed. That wow. was awesome. That was some great stuff in there. Mm -hmm. uh, Reed, why don't you give your, uh, your final message to the people, plug anything you want to plug? Uh, uh, I, as I say, I'm net neutral. I don't have a channel anymore. I participate, you know, leech off. By the way, I wanted to say to anybody who's watching, I once saw a negative comment about paying to be on the chats. People, you don't pay to be on the chats. You pay to support the channel. Doing these chats is a fringe benefit. And frankly, it's one of the most fun things I've done in my adult life. So, uh, you know, if that's not worth a, a contribution from you, then don't contribute. But man, I love it. Cool. Thanks, wow. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Like uh -huh. um, all right, so we've got two 9.5s. We've got a 7.5. Last but not least, let's, uh, the master of the, the physical, as, uh, as it were, uh, let's get uh, Jamie, your opinion. Yeah, that's all I got. You guys really did your homework. You had a lot of history, a lot of facts. I just came with some stupid opinions. <laughs> um, but yes, I do agree. It is the Strange Highways. It's kind of like part two of this album which I always thought had the dumbest album cover ever. It looks like a demo tape cover 
of like a speed metals first band uh, like their first album a bunch of 15 year olds maybe one of the guitars drew it real quick at night what do you think of this for the cover yeah throw it on there yeah. and they sold it at their concerts i don't know who okayed that cover but so th this one which i bought at a record store and i didn't know what it was at the time and i got home and i found out it was part of a box set someone just took it out of a do box set hmm. and traded it in there is an original pressing down the street from me at a record store from uh 1994 or maybe 93 uk pressing or something they won 200 dollars for it wow yeah um but here's the here is the original cd i bought and as you can see it has the cutout and i was curious when i saw that today it's like when did i buy this i must have not i was a dio fan but i didn't buy it right away so I looked at my history here and look at this. I have, I have been keeping track since the very first CD I bought in 1985 of every CD I, I buy in order. So page one is my handwriting as a 14, 15 year old. I got Jimi Hendrix and uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon as my first. So this one I looked up Dio Strange Highways, and I see I bought right before it Earthling um, by David Bowie. So I, I got one it. of those too. Oh, okay. So, see? I started this in 1979 and quit it in the mid in the mid uh, in the mid nice. uh, 90s. But yeah, I, same I, thing. Price of everything, traded it away, traded it back, whatever. It's, ain't it fun uh, to be a nerd? It's all in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have my cassettes too. I, I don't really buy cassettes anymore, but I got page one from 1982. Anyways, back on topic. I always thought Angry Machines was a heavier album than Strange Highways. Maybe I need to listen to this again, but in my mind, this is a heavier album. But these albums I don't play, later deal, I don't play very often. And the more music I buy, you know, I'm buying new bands, new music, I'm buying old bands, old music. My wheelhouse and my rotation wheel gets bigger and bigger. When I was 14, I had what, 30 cassettes? So the rotation went pretty quick. Now, when I listen to an album and it passes, it takes a long time to come back around these days. So here's the thing with Strange Highways in my ears. I did not like it when I first bought it. I found Jesus, Mary and the Holy Ghost to be very jarring. and you know, I like Dio to be fun. I like big melodies and I view, I'm viewing these songs from a song writing point of view. I, I look at a song like a building. Does it have a fine, nice foundation? You know, how's it built? Uh, if it's weird, is it like a cool, weird building? Does it still hold up? Things like that. And I gotta tell you, I'm probably talking out my ass and I don't know what I'm talking about, but this is the view I see sometimes in later Dio. Sometimes the well goes dry with writing really memorable songs. You know, it, you can't write Rainbow in the Dark over and over songs just as catchy and memorable. So if the well goes a little dry with the melodies, I'm not talking about lyrics, I'm talking about mostly melodies. Maybe you go, well, I, I can't outright myself when I was 30, maybe I just get heavier. Maybe I just get heavier and that makes up for the lack of melodies. And then I will hone in on those people who think heavy first and they'll still love this album to death. Maybe he did that, maybe he didn't, I don't know. Um, but that's what I sense. And I also think it's easier, I don't know, it's not like I'm, a songwriter or anything, but it seems like it's easier to write a weird song than a memorable song. It's almost easier to, you know, you play great, you're always gonna play great, but the well goes dry for songwriting. So if I just play great, and if I get a little weird and, and do some sound effects and throw them in there, it comes off as creative, but it's not memorable. And that's the hard thing to do. Y y May, but then I look at all the dumb pop songs that are memorable and I'm like, so are you telling me it's easier to do that King, than King Crimson songs? I don't know. I, I, I have a war in my head sometimes with myself. Um, but yeah, Jesus and the Mary and the Holy Ghost, it, it, 
another thing about this album is it's a grower. And not only is it a grower, but if you don't listen to it for a while and you come back to it maybe two years later, you have to warm up to it again. It grew on you two years ago. You were digging it. You come in cold again and you got to let it warm up and let it grow on you all over again. So when I came in to do this video, I listened to this for about a week. You hear, eh, eh. All right. oh God, I, I wish it wasn't the opener because it, it brings me back to the 90s when I heard it the first time and bad thoughts come back into my head. And then Firehead comes on and I feel like, nah, it's okay. It's okay. But Strange Highways is a very cool, doomier Egypt the Chains are on that Martin kind of referenced. It, 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 on paper, I'm not a big fan of slower Dio either, but that song works for me. Um, then Hollywood Black came on, and as it was warming up to me again this past week, I'm thinking, is this album getting better as I listen to it, or am I just warming up to it as it, as it plays along? I don't know. Evolution is normally a bad sign I, for me when the title of the song is trying to be too clever and trying to, it means the song is going to be trying too hard as a whole. And it does kind of, yeah, like I said, it's easier to be weird. Let's throw in this weird voice in the middle and let, let's do these weird sounds. And yeah, okay, it's a masterpiece. Uh, not for me. I forgot to mention on that one, that's one where where the, oh, the only time you hear Vinny doing a Stuart Copeland beat. <laughs> ah, there you go. Yeah. See, you guys are smart. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> Stuart Copeland beat. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then pain. I tell you what, that opening, this is such an angry album. Give me a choice between pleasure and pain. I choose pain. My God, Ronnie, <laughs> whatever happened to it's only a mystery. <laughs> Come on, man. Let's have some fun. When I listen to Dio, I want to have fun. Some bands, I you know, I listen to a band like why well, I brought them up last time, Elder. I don't listen to Elder for fun, but I go to them for that reason. When I go to Dio, I think, fun time, you want to do this. This album doesn't make me do this. <laughs> this album makes me do this, but it doesn't make me do this. Uh, One Foot in the Grave is really good, and it's, it's welcomed when it, came, when it comes on. And it, it's not upbeat, but for what we just went through, it feels upbeat compared to the songs that came before. Uh, Give Her the Gun, it's a slower song, but it, it sounds like it's from the heyday a little bit, which is good and bad. It's good that it sounds like it's maybe could have came off of Last in Line, but it's bad because why can't you do an upbeat song that sounds like the heyday? You did this, where's the upbeat song? Um, Blood from a so Stone, nothing to, uh, Nothing that knocks my socks off. Here's to you is the closest banger we get on here. That's kind of like stand up and shout and we rock. And I wish this would have kicked off the album. This instead of <laughs> here's to you, bam. Then put Jesus, Mary and the Holy Ghost around track eight or something, you know, when I'm getting tired of the record anyways. And then bringing down the rain, you're like, okay, Ronnie's got his mojo back though. Let's go, let's go. We're on a roll. Oh, it's the last song. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so I have very mixed feelings about this album. Uh, yes, it grew on me again. Yes, when I listen to it again in two years from now, it'll have to grow on me yet again. Um, if you want a rating here, it, it, it hmm. I mean, it's, do I have to do five or can I do like 0.8 or something like that? <laughs> can I do 0 0.8046? Um, I'm going to go with, I'm going to be generous and give it a seven. But I'm being generous. I would think, I would like to give it like a 6.8, but we'll round it up to a seven. Okay. <laughs> oh, and come to my page. Uh, let's get physical where you see all this shit around me. It's all about physical media, DVDs, CDs behind the camera. You can't see, um, 
comic books, magazines, whatever you got, whatever makes you happy, take a picture of it, throw it on there. We'll all talk about it. We'll tell you how cool you are for owning it and how we wish we had it too. That will make you feel good about your purchases. So come over there, uh, see me on, see a tranquility where I talk nonsense over there too. I think we, uh, we're going to do the cult pretty soon, Martin. Uh, Chris Allo just said, oh, I don't know if I can make it this yeah, I week. Know. So I know. we're going to be pushing that can down to about yeah. 2000 until I'm listening to this album again in about two years. Yeah, we'll yeah. push it down till then. <laughs> yeah cool wicked awesome nice. all right so we crunched all the numbers here and uh it looks like we got an average of uh it's giving me three decimal points i'm gonna round up to uh to to one here so we're just gonna call this uh an 8.4 according to uh the panel um, yeah yeah it's, it, it seems like pretty uh yeah. pretty in line we had two people who really like this album we had two people who like the album uh, i will say uh and you know grain of salt I, I i'm not a huge deal fan i've not listened to a lot i listened to this album for the first time on the way home and uh i really liked it and i gotta say it sounded diabolical in the in the best possible way it sounded yeah. diabolical yeah. uh it's mean and uh and, and uh, I, I thought it was great but uh i won't uh, sully the the uh, scores here with with uh you know a one lesson review Nick, can, can i throw out one more real quick thought about the lyrics because I was thinking about this when Peter was talking. Uh, so Dio didn't totally avoid his favorite themes because he talks about wishes. And I think it's hilarious. If you, if you look at Dio's whole career, you go back to uh, the Heaven and Hell album with Black Sabbath, and he has the song Wishing Well, which is very upbeat, right? And very, uh, very uh, optimistic. Then in Strange Highways, all the wishes you've made have filled up the well. And then by the time we get to Master of the Moon, it's, don't you realize wishes only come true in dreams? <laughs> so I'm not somebody, sure what that says about the man's life trajectory, but uh, there you have so, it. Somebody drowned in that wishing well, right? Nice. <laughs> you want to see my favorite later Dio album? Go right. for it. It's a mixed CD I made of those three albums, uh, wow. Angry Machines to Master the Moon. Wow. I made my own of those four, the best songs from those four albums. Yeah. Now that's a pretty good solid album. Nice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> very it. nice. Very nice. Wow, this was good. This was yeah, good. yeah. I, I, again, you know, uh, so so much knowledge, so uh, so so much, so many great opinions here, uh, all all brought together. So thank you to uh, to each and every one of you, Jamie. Do you have anything else uh, you want to say to the the audience? We we sort of you, you dived right into your plug, so I want to make sure you got a chance, just like everyone else. I, I got my plug in, right? I didn't yeah. freeze, did I? I wasn't. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, you got, <laughs> it, you got it in. But, uh... <laughs> okay, good. I, then I got it all in. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to give Martin the, the very last word. But uh, before I do that, let's uh, just go over that housekeeping stuff again. Patreon, uh, like and subscribe, Kofi, Teespring, any way you want to support the channel, you know, even if that's just watching this video. Man, we really, we really appreciate it. It's, it's not how much the channel has grown. It's amazing uh, how many, you know, opinions and, and 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 how much, how much you know I get to learn from this. I know Marco feels the same way. Um, so thank you, thank you to everyone here. Thank you to everyone watching at home. And we uh, started get, we started giving money to this channel before you guys said, hey, do you want to come on? So it was that's like true. months and then, Oh, okay. Sure. That's, that's, that's true. And I'm, I'm, I'm still amazed. And, uh, it's, uh, wow. What, what a great group of people we got here. So, so cool. So without further uh, ado, I'm going to give it over to, uh, to Martin, any last word you want to give, uh, the people at home or anyone here? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to say Jamie, like this is my favorite part of doing this now is doing these dark horse panels. I love these things because just hearing all these opinions, and I, I swear one day I still want to think about transcribing these and, and doing something with them and uh, collating them all together and like just really condensing it down and using the best stuff. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this has been a lot of fun. So, uh, so thanks again, guys. And another one in the books, I, I think uh, the rush hold your fire, which I wasn't part of, I just went up recently and, and a couple other panels but we've got a few in the can and i think uh nick and and marco are working diligently to uh to move those along i think uh i think everything we've been doing is going to go up pretty soon so uh yeah 
I, I, I love doing these panels with you guys and, uh, yeah, we shall, uh, we shall talk. I guess I'm doing the goodbye then, right, Nick? Is that it? <laughs> That's it. That's okay, it. Okay. So, uh, thanks again, guys. We'll see you again, uh, next time and go listen to some deal. Thanks guys. Okay. See ya. Thanks, guys. Everyone.